giving you a bit of an interdisciplinary talk um, that combines both computer science and biology. Since uh, I did my undergrad in uh, both comp sci and bio. And uh, for my final, for my, uh, final project, um, it was in biology, and it had to do um, some tasks that were somewhat repetitive. And um, since I was exposed to the joys of programming, I just couldn't sit there and you know, do that. It was very frustrating for me. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I went ahead and, and tried to automate that process and uh, the analysis of the data in question. Um, so, all right, so why did I choose Python? Well, Python um, has a huge array of libraries, and um, since my task involved uh, scientific computing, so um, there, were, there was, the, of course, is the library SciPy, which was um, like suitable to my purposes. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so Python is, is the way to go. Um, okay. So I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you a bit of an intro of what my project in biology entailed, um, and um, basically um, we were interested in studying um, protein dynamics, as in how fast is the protein going inside the nucleus and outside of the nucleus. So this little sphere here is the nucleus, and here is what we call the cytoplasm, and this is a cell. Um, and the question is, um, so right now, um, the brighter spots represent the, the areas where the protein is most present. So what we can tell from this, this image is that the protein is most present here compared to the cytoplasm. But we don't really know how fast it's going in and out of the, uh, in and out of the nucleus. So the, uh, one way to, um, to measure how fast this is happening is to use a really, really strong laser and to just blast it here. So that's what happened. And so since there's, um, there's a constant shuttling back and forth of this protein in and out of the nucleus, the, the rate of recovery of this area is indicative of how fast the protein is going in, like the net movement of the protein, because of course it's going in and out. So if this recovery is slow, it means the, tra the transport is slow. So. So how exactly did I measure this? Um, I took, uh, I measured two areas from the nucleus, two areas from the cytoplasm, and two areas from the background, just to subtract, uh, subtract the noise. So the issue with this is that um, this is the kind of output I get. You know, it's like just huge um, Excel sheets. Um, and I want to bring your attention to, to this number, which is very worrying for me. <laughs> um, Sorry? Yeah, that's the problem. Like each time I opened the Excel sheet, I waited 10 minutes. So I was, uh, it was getting pretty much out of hand. And you need to imagine this. So like 300, 300 um, uh, time points times six, because I'm me measuring six regions, times 30, 369 movies and counting. So. so for me, this wasn't really an option. And I just reverted to programming, um, just trying to you know, structure the data in a more uh, efficient manner. So one other issue is that I need to keep track of metadata, as in, so what, what, uh, when, which day did I take this data on? Uh, what mutant am I looking at? By the way, because I'm actually uh, measuring the dynamics of mutant proteins. So there are different versions of this protein that have, you know, just one area that is changing compared to the original template. Um, also, whether I'm blasting the nucleus or the cytoplasm, so that's the type of FRAP. Oh, by the way, FRAP stands for fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. So this makes sense, now that I say it? It makes sense, right? <laughs> um, okay, and many more things. Um, so also, uh, what if I change the way I analyze this raw data? Like, how do, what if I change how I normalize the curves, the recovery curves? What if I change how I want to fit the data to a certain function? Like, if I did that on Excel, I'd have to change, you know, a bunch of cells, and it will take forever. So this was me at some point. <laughs> 
Um, so enter Django. So Django is a web framework for perfectionists. <laughs> um, and um, so why was Django suitable for me, for my purposes? Well, first of all, it's written in Python. And like I said, there's a bunch of libraries that can come in handy. Um, second of all, uh, it's uh, pretty readable uh, for me. It's pretty concise. It's a concise language, in my opinion. Um, uh, furthermore, um, we can actually, uh, it's, it's a modular kind of framework so that um, if you change, if you want to change the way the data is presented, so for example, if you want to change the template, you don't have to go back and look at the code and change your database schema and all that. So um, that was also attractive for me. Um, okay. So now I'm going to just show you, so by the way, um, I think, I guess a lot of you are familiar with Django. Who is familiar with Django here? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is must be a review for you. But I guess it's just an idea of how Django can be used for a similar, for a, uh, a task that you're not really used to see it used for, so. Okay. So for example, for each movie, I have, uh, I have a class for each movie, and I assign, so the metadata problem here is resolved since I can assign, um, you know, the, the metadata to different uh, fields of the class. Um, so for example, uh, here's the date, here are some comments, um, you know. I can also um, link it to another, to another class, which is mutant. So here you have a foreign key. I don't know, stuff like that. Um, one other thing that came in handy is that, you know, each time I bleached uh, the nucleus, the exact frame at which um, the level was zero was variable since it was taken at 200 milliseconds interval. So that changed. So this, this allows me, uh, this is a way for me to, you know, um, to, to define the bleached frame index in a better way than you know, going through the Excel sheet. Also, uh, uh, some movies were faulty, so this is a way for me to have a flag, you know, make to, to, to tag things as valid or not. Uh, yeah. So, this is one example template. So, you see how it's very clean. Um, you can do pretty much uh, anything with this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. One other thing is that um, I personally am not versed in SQL or any other database language. So, for me, uh, Django was a way for me to, you know, uh, abstract. It was a. Um, I mean, so I didn't need to know SQL or anything to be able to use a database and in a structured manner and have it uh, flow efficiently. So. Also, the Django administration interface was a plus. Um, and I'll show you later how that goes into it. Okay. Um, this is another example uh, model. So this is a mutation uh, where we have, um, you know, different fields that express it. And more importantly, a mutant is actually an assortment of mutations because a mutant might be might have many mutations. So here I have also a many-to-many -many field. Um, and then I can have nifty things like uh, if I want to know, the, for, for example, the number of import movies for a, particular, uh, for a particular mutant, then I can use one single qu query. And this is uh, very efficient because it passes the database only once. So, um, so you filter for the mutant, for this mutant, for the import category, and for only valid movies. And then you count those. So that's just one way. Uh, this is an example view. So this is the kind of view that you would pass to the template we saw earlier. So we'd pass the template a bunch of movies, and then the template would use that information to render it. Okay. All right. So this is the 
um, Django Web Adms Administration Interface I talked about. So for example, um, here, so I blurred this because it's, uh, you know, unpublished data. <laughs> but this, these should be actual codons. Anyways, this is a dummy mutation. Um, yeah. These are mutants, and a mutant is an assortment of mutations. You can add stuff here, like this mutant, mutant one is only mutation one. And here are the parameters associated with that mutant that I fit. Um, this is a movie. And you can also filter. This is really nice. Okay. So you can see how this is much better than the Excel alternative. <coughs> OK. OK, well, these are. Yeah, this is using Bootstrap. So for example, here I have all my experiments. and. Um, I have them green if they're valid, otherwise red. And I have some notes, and it's, uh, I can look at them. I don't know. Let's get a good one. So for example, this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this is all the data I showed you. So this is a nuclear region, the cytoplasm region, and the uh, background region, and then it it uh, calculates the raw ratio, normalizes it. This is the raw data. And then outputs a, uh, a curve like this, where you go from 0 to 100. So there are problems. Like, for example, in some movies, the first frames were noisy, such that you'd have a pretty high, like, relatively high intensity, and then lower intensity, and then higher intensity. And that posed a problem in terms of normalization, because I want to set at 0 the first frame that has you know, uh, low intensity. So in this case, uh, one solution I came up, I came with was to take the average of a few base frames. So like this, I can say, I want this point here to be um, considered as a base frame. So I, I clicked here, so this is 5.1, 5.1. And then I can uh, refit this. And it updates the curve, and it updates the parameters here. And it's all, you know, nice. Um, one other cool thing is uh, that I can also analyze data in bulk. So I can use all this data and aggregate it and, you know, have a nice vis visualization out of it. Um, also, you know, I can set things as invalid, like this one. I don't want it. So I refresh it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, this one. Yeah, this is another example of just summary, of a summary kind of graph. OK. All right, so the next part of my talk, I'm just going to you know, briefly mention how I, cur I fitted the curves for the different mutants using SciPy. So um, I used uh, least squares. Um, OK. So this here is the function that, uh, that uh, represents um, the curve, um, the recovery curve. So I can talk to it. Okay. I can just explain it in terms of math, of math here. So Actually, just KX. OK, so um, this is exponential of negative x. Uh, what happens if you do 1 minus this? So as x goes to infinity, uh, this approach is 1. Um, so I multiply this by 100, and then I get a curve that goes from 0 to 100. So this is my model, basically.
But then I noticed that some curves looked like mixtures of two of such curves. So, um, so this is why I have a fast, um, fast phase times um, you know, the expression we saw before, and then a slow phase. And this basically just means we have a mixture. Um, and then I defined a residuals functions. And this, uh, this function uh, measures the difference between um, my actual data and my um, expected data based on uh, the parameters I fit. So this is just a way to measure how far my model is from the actual data. And then once you define these two functions, and note that the residuals functions, uh, function uses the two-phase association model, once you do that, um, you use, uh, so this is my raw data, I mean, my actual data. Uh, this is just a guess. And then you can use least squares and uh, enter the residuals function. And then from here, you get all the parameters you need. So this is how I, I fit the parameters in my web app. So, yeah. So yeah, bottom line, automation is great, um, but make sure it's worth it. Because <laughs> I think, I mean, if I had to count the, the time I spent um, automating things, maybe it would have taken the same amount of time uh, actually doing things manually. But uh, the good thing is that there's an, there's a, so an undergrad is taking on the project for this semester, so he's going to be able to use this, and it's all good for him. So it's, 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 it's better for the future. I hope I don't get here. <laughs> uh, all right. So thanks.